Dr. Jonathan Miller is here, or should I say Sir Jonathan Miller? Mm. He is <laughs> a noted director of theater and opera and films. He's also a physician and television producer. He was awarded a knighthood by the Queen in 2002. His most recent production is King Lear, which goes up at Lincoln Center on March 4th. It stars Christopher Plummer. I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Jonathan Miller back to this program. Welcome back. Nice to be here. King Lear, what's the attraction for you in directing King Lear? And what is the story about to you? Because I sat down mm. with you and, I, and we were talking about some executive compensation in America. Mm. And we were talking about you living where you are. In fact, C CEOs are coming in, people with... Mm. And you said, that's part of what Lear is about. Well, I, I think Lear is is not what it's thought to be about, a great cosmic drama. Yeah. And people get confused by the thunderstorm that takes place, yeah, which right. lasts about four minutes, if that. Um, Lear and his jester. Yeah, it's about homelessness. It's about, it's about what happens if you lose everything. And the whole, the play is about the learning that results from loss. From um, being shed of clothes and identity and, and all and the rank, things. That and rank, privilege and, and privilege. entitlement right. and status. Right. Um, and finding out what? Then? Finding out something about the what, in fact, are basic needs. Reason not the need is what uh, Leah says when he's told by his daughters what needs, what, what, uh, uh, why, why do you need this retinue? Do you need 25, 10, 5, 2, or 1? And he says house? reason not reason the need. Reason not the need. Um, you know, that, uh, uh, you know, nature... If you deprive nature more than nature needs, man's life is worse than brutes. And he then confronts what happens when, in fact, you are deprived of everything. He says very early on in the play, look, nothing will come of nothing to his daughter, who says yeah, when she asks him to speak, of memory, nothing will come of nothing. Nothing will come of nothing. And we discover throughout the play, for him and for many of the other characters, that actually the experience of nothing becomes everything, that they have to go through the Nothing. chastening experience of total loss, and that there's a wonderful moment in the storm, and the storm has nothing to do with it. What it's to do with is houselessness, homelessness, yeah. poor, houseless wretches. I have taken too little care of this, says the king. Um, um, he has, from his high point in the social order, he has not seen what the life of the unentitled, the underprivileged, the underemployed, the non-employed, the beggars endure. And that actually it is by the going through the experience of loss that he begins to discover the essential nature of the human soul. Lear was how old in he's, the play? Well, he's meant to be about 80. I mean, about 80 he, in he, the says, play. he says that he's 80, yes. He yeah. says uh, four score years. Most people believe, along with Hamlet, is the best two characters Shakespeare ever wrote. Um, well, I think that's very debatable. There are lots of very interesting characters that run in, in all his plays. It, it's the most interesting play that Shakespeare ever wrote, because? I think. Well, because it involves the, a very complicated representation, first of all, of this question of need, necessity, right, right. loss, and uh, of nothingness and somethingness, um, and what we gain by losing. I stumbled when I saw, says the, the Earl of Gloucester, having lost his eyes. I stumbled? I stumbled when I saw. Could you, do you know most of the dialogue? I know most of the dialogue, yes. I mean, I can't utter long sections of the verse, but I know what, I, 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 I've directed it many times, and I yeah. know it inside out. And I do think that people are, as I say, misled by the storm into thinking that it's a cosmic play of man against the cosmos. It's not. It's about the nature of the social order, that if we... Um, disrupt the social order and fall outside the social order into what we call nature yeah. um, actually life's man is man's life is is worse than beasts that we are as Hobbes said later on in the Leviathan and he wrote it only 50 years or so after the publication of the of King Lear that man's life in a state of nature is nasty brutish and short and we've seen that in the last, well, <laughs> perhaps the last century, that you disrupt social orders, you tear things apart, you remove sovereignty or authority and power which keeps things together, 
We saw it in the former Yugoslavia. Yeah, I say that. You saw it. Tito kept it together. Kept Tito's it together. gone. And, and as it... soon as it gone, these, these, these previously imperceptible fracture lines between yeah. the various communities become glaringly apparent, and people fall upon one another. Well, there are people who worry about that very thing in Iraq. Well, it will happen. Between the Kurds and the Sunnis and the Between the Kurds Shiites. and the Sunnis and the Shiites. Yeah. It, 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 it occurs wherever people who have lived together for long periods of time, um, some sort of social disruption occurs which removes authority and order, and suddenly the recognition of the difference of the other then creates atrocity. When all this is rank and, and everything else and finery is all removed, uh, and the measurement of a good life is what? Well, I think, I, I, I think Shakespeare never talks about what the measurement of a good life is, but he simply says there is, as it were, uh, the necessary though by no means the sufficient condition of a good life, is in fact um, certainly social order. For him, as yeah. I think for many people in the 17th century, particularly on, on the edge of the English Civil right. War when everything fell apart as a result of the Civil War, a belief that m a sovereign authority right. yep. was what was required. Now we don't think that because we right, went right. through the process of democratic but sovereignty. But said another way, this was his, he was constantly in, in study of monarchy, was he? Well, not? he was constantly in study, study of monarchy and of the necessary characteristics which the monarch should have in order to fill the role. Yeah, and he saw yeah. in the family structures which were the counterpart of what were to be seen in society. The father was to his children, or might be to his children, sovereign. as the sovereign is to his subjects. And that um, the play starts with an act of rash and idiotic frivolity on the part of this king to divide his kingdom in itself a frivolous act and choose between children and choose between children on the basis of what they say to him to him as uh, as the how much they love him yeah. it's hard and to the imagine the one that that does best that, that the one that is most well, the one who is most valued, valued uh, late, says, late, the says, says the latest, says the least, says the, little, says the least, yes. Right, least. And of course, it is like, as Freud says, the like the essay on the three caskets, that um, <laughs> the fools choose the gold and the silver and not realize that dumb lead contains the truth. Um, and that that is something very interesting yeah. about her. But on the other hand, perhaps we've overstressed the virtue of this young, obstinate, Cordelia, Why? But who goes well, away to be the Queen of France? Who goes away to be the Super Queen of France, who says nothing. And uh, I cannot, she says, heave my heart into my mouth. And you actually find yourself wanting to say, um, hang on, why not? <laughs> Have a go. Yes. Um, it won't cost you too much to, uh, for a little bit of dishonest flattery. Mm -hmm. um, why do you value your, your uh, moral chastity so much that you refuse to yeah. heave your heart into your mouth? There's another character in Measure for Measure, um, Isabella, who won't lay down uh, her virtue um, for her brother's life. Angelo right. says that he will sleep with her and release her brother, and he, she refuses. And what we say, well, dear, why not try to lay down, close your eyes and think of England. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's exactly. In other words, I think Shakespeare's right. Shakespeare's That's always correct. wonderfully complicated about right. these characters. Right. What looked like um, simple distinctions between the two wicked sisters right. and the virtuous Cinderella, Pern. between the gold and the silver, which are valueless, and the lead, which contains the, the choices value. are much more complicated. They're much more complicated. They're much more blurred. And that's what makes Shakespeare so fascinating and what makes the play so fascinating is that it's filled with blurs. And um, instead of a majestic king, what you get is a king whose two elder daughters say of him, look, the best of his times have been but rash. He hath ever but slenderly known himself. Has Shakespeare provided more enjoyment to your life than you ever, ever could have imagined as a young man? More no. sense of... No, I've enjoyed doing Shakespeare as much as almost anyone because he's so complicated. Right. Um, I haven't done all of his plays by any means. Um, and uh, I think in, in ways, I enjoy the tragedies, or the so-called tragedies. I hate those denominations. They're, they don't really count very much. Um, I mean, Samuel Johnson was once asked about Shakespeare's divisions into tragedies and comedies, and he said that it's, they actually are not to be divided in that way. He said they reflect the natural condition of our sublunary life, <laughs> in which, he said, 
the reveler on the way to his bottle meets the mourner on the way to the grave and where the malice of one is undone by the frolic of another. Well, I think that that's what makes Shakespeare's plays so interesting. You never quite know whether you're in the presence of a comedy or a tragedy. And one of the things that I said to Chris when we were working together, which convinced him that he should do the play, he wanted to do a comedy. That's and, right, I remember somebody told me that. Yeah, but he wanted, and, and how did you, you convinced him by saying well, that I said, there was comedy? I, no, I said, actually, I said, L Lear is one of the best comedies that Shakespeare ever wrote. And he says about you. Mm. Christopher Plummer, that you know and found, you helped him find that humor mm. in, in Lear, and that made it even so much more satisfying than it might have been for Well, him. it was much more real, you see. Yeah. If, if you make it into, a, again, a cosmically majestic uh, uh, role, it may satisfy a lot of people who are looking for operatic bullshit, but mm. that's really not what it's about. Yeah. Um, and again, there is wonderful humor in those daughters. Um, I mean, one of the best lines that Shakespeare ever wrote, I, mean, I think any uh, writer of comedy would cherish himself for having written this wonderful line when Lear goes bumbling out into the storm and uh, having had his retinue cut down yeah. by these two daughters. And they're obviously embarrassed by what they've done. And one turns to the other in the silence and says, this house is little. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it, it's such a, a brilliant piece of bathos and suburbanism. Yes. Shakespeare has also about choices, obviously. Yes, it is. It's about, uh, the, and also mundane daily choices, um, and about choices inside families, and the reflection of the choices that occur in families as reflected in, in courts. What are the most important choices you have made? In and this? No, in your life. Oh, in I mean, other words, the, with the choice to go to medical school, the choice to spend time away from medicine, even though you mm -hmm. have stayed connected because you have done all kinds of television series about the human yeah. body and, and well, other scientific made, exploration. Yes, I never made a choice of going to medical school. It was, it, I think I thought of it as... Somebody made you go? It, no, it was what I was going to do from the age of about 11. I mean, Because I, of... Well, partly my father, who... Right. And I was surrounded with shelf after shelf of books on neurology and yeah. on anthropology and philosophy. Um, and I was, I found myself reading things that he had read and was interested in that. And also I had a small shed in the back garden where I did chemistry and I yeah. used to, you know, do, I, I used to love the work I did with burettes and pipettes and flasks and beakers and so forth. And I loved collecting animals. I, I was absolutely addicted to marine zoology when I yeah. was about 15 or 16. And then I thought, well, perhaps really what I wanted to do was to go into medicine because I wanted to find out how the brain worked. So that I was already, from a very early stage, on a scientific uh, path. Mm -hmm. um, and it was only because of the, the, the catastrophic accident of doing this Beyond the Fringe, yes. which I did for a, I, that was as my a, next as a vacation job. Without Beyond the Fringe, there would never have no, been I'd, I'd gone necessarily on, this career in theatre. No, no, theater I'd, I'd have gone on being a doctor. And I would have, I suppose, become what you call a consultant, and I hope that I would have gone on to do uh, clinical research in neurology. Other than, other than the fact that Beyond the Fringe was such an explosive yeah. and popular series. Yeah. Dudley Moore and Peter Cook and you and... And Alan Bennett as and well. Alan yeah. Bennett, exactly. Dudley's dead. Peter's dead. Yeah. Alan Bennett. He's alive. He's alive and well, and well yes. in London. Yes. Yeah. Uh, did you guys remain close? No. We, we, we were never really that close during the show. I mean, we, we, we worked on the show um, for about a month, six weeks when we first put it together. Um, then we would come in every night and do the show and then went our separate ways. I think we, Alan, Alan Bennett and I saw more of each other because he was more of an academic and therefore we had academic interests in common. Um, but I don't think I saw very much of Peter or Dudley. And Peter and Dudley performed together before They performed that. together right. and they went off, um, right. you know, and did their own thing. And together I, and I, then I, apart. I, together and then apart. Um, but I really never saw them more than once a year. And sometimes, in the case of Dudley, because he was over on the West Coast doing films and so forth, I, I did direct him once, about ten years after Beyond the Fringe, when I did a production of The Mikado in Los Angeles, and yeah. he played Coco for me. But otherwise, no, we didn't. We, did, we, uh, 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 and we didn't have a close friendship. Uh, but doing it convinced you what? That you loved the theatre? No, that no, this was a whole all. life that no, you no, could have no, access no, to? No, 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 it's never been like that at all, Charlie. I mean, I think it's... <laughs> every, everything that's happened to me has been... Serendipitous? Uh, it means yes, as accident and, and serendipity. You see, as soon as I finished doing the the, the work in 
in London before we came to New York. I had six weeks to spare before I came to play Beyond the Fringe on Broadway. Yeah. And George Devine, who ran the Royal Court Theatre, had a, um, a play of John Osborne's which no one else wanted to do. Um, it was part of a double bill. Yeah. And so he said, oh, well, we'll get one of those angry young, those boy, angry right, young right. Uh, funny boys down right. at the thing. And he said, um, he'll, he'll match this angry uh, playwright. And so I did, he, and I said, I don't know how to direct a play. He said, well, you'll, yeah, I'm sure you'll find your way around it. <laughs> I mean, it was desperation because I think no one else wanted to do it. And I actually found within about the first 20 minutes of doing it, I said, oh, I, I, I can do this. I find this quite easy. Um, I know how to do this. And then I didn't think about it again for another two years because I was... Now, how do you I, expect you... How do you... How do you explain that you could do it? It's just well, that you had natural instincts and natural well, uh, rhythms and natural no, pitch that no, no, made no, it no, perfect? It's, it's to do with the observation, I think, which I, I, I... People often say it was to do with my medicine. Yeah. But actually what I think is that the, my skill as a diagnostician, which I was, was considerable when I was young, as and my skill as a director, which is still considerable, now yeah. I'm old, come from a common source, which is um, an interest in the observation of the totally negligible. In the uh, observation, observation looking at? Yes, looking at the totally, the totally negligible. negligible. I've learned gradually as time's gone on that really that uh, the things we think of as most important or the most significant are nothing more than large heaps of trivial detail. And that's actually where the that's where the uh, that's where the the treasure is the treasure is to be found in the little nuances of behavior which people um, but that's the novelist gift too well yes and i think probably that it yes i think that i share that with uh with um, with my mother who was a, a novelist who observed with great subtlety and liked trivial yeah. detail i've always had an enormous admiration for for flaubert for madame bovary you can't imagine um, a more trivial slut than Emma Bovary, <laughs> and yet the yes. heaps of my minuscule trivial detail which Flaubert heaps together to give the life of this otherwise negligible trollop yeah. significance and importance makes it into a work. Yeah, of, but how does that apply work. to a director's work? It, it's it's what the work the director's work consists of, um, and I I say this many times you most of the important work, apart from deciding where it takes place and what the setting is going to be, and that takes place long before you meet the actors, um, I mean, in, in this particular case, I'll come back to it in a minute, uh, it consists of nothing more than reminding people of what they knew all along but had forgotten. You only have to say, have you ever noticed when people are thinking that they will sometimes be talking to you and doing that, yeah. And they say, yes, of course. And I say, well, do that, please. Yes. Um, why don't you do that on the stage when you do that all the time in life? Well, or running your hand around the edge of a glass while thinking and talking to someone. You worked with Olivier. Yes. Is that something he had as an actor? Um, no, he didn't altogether. I had to, br I had to remind him of it and, so get, the, him, and get him to do stuff. What most people consider one of the great actors ever to well, he was, stand on the... British stage. Well, well, he was. He was in a very extraordinary Did not actor. necessarily have this but, exquisite sense of but he could, detail uh, and But he could that. reproduce it if you, if you actually you remi if you reminded ah, him. And that's an actor's talent. And then he loved it. I mean, and he loved he the loved act to be, of doing it and showing you that if you told him... Yeah, he'd like to have... You see, for example, I remember when I did The Merchant of Venice, he wanted to have a moment of, of, of triumph at the moment when he heard that Antonio's ships had gone down. Is it true? Yeah. Is it true? He said, okay. And he said, my dear boy, we must think of a spectacular thing to do here. And I said, well, <laughs> is it that the way he thought? Yes. He said, I said, it needn't be spectacular in order to be interesting. Why don't you do something quite trivial and, but odd? And I said, listen, there's a moment of triumph in a little newsreel I'll show you of Hitler doing a dance, a little dance of triumph in the railway carriage at Compiègne at the surrender of France. Yeah. He just suddenly does a little jig. Yeah. So it's, it's over in about 10 seconds. I said, L -l 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 just do that. I said, keep it down, keep it down, make it hardly noticeable. Is it true? Is it true? And he did this little dance and he said, oh, thank you. <laughs> and um, those, those trivial details, when, you, when, they, when it's all put together, you realize that's all our life consists of. It just consists of a mosaic of tiny, behaviors which by which we present ourselves to others
a, amount of time, but have you learned more about living from Shakespeare than any other particular source other than your own experience? No. No, no, no. no. I mean, all that I... Can't, I, I can't I, make some large statement like no, that, no, that. No, no, no. I just, I just enjoy reading him and I enjoy producing him because he actually is interested in these sorts of... Uh, a trivial detail. He's been magnified too much to his own disadvantage. He's been made monumental. There's a very great phrase usually used um, very misleadingly um, with a, what I call a march of time voice about yeah, Shakespeare right, right. Voice in, of we, God uh, in which they yeah. say Shakespeare represents perhaps arguably one of the great works of the mind of man. <laughs> now as soon as I hear the mind of man invoked, yeah. I know you're in deep trouble. <laughs> and it's, yes. it's the triviality of the profound. Thank you for coming. Thank it's you. a pleasure to have you. Jonathan Miller, King Lear is at Lincoln Center. It opens next week, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, Christopher Plummer as Lear. I'm sure a Sterling Cass that we'll know more about. Uh, thank you again. Thank, thank you, you for joining us. We'll see you next time.